Dr. Eastburn has been at the University of Illinois, I'm, I'm guessing, Darren, for 20, 25 years, perhaps. He's had several different hats while he's at the University of Illinois Extension, but he's by training a plant pathologist. He was the uh, extension plant pathologist for some years during his tenure at University of Illinois Extension, or at University of Illinois. He currently conducts research and teaches several classes as well, so we're very pleased to have Darren with us. Darren is no stranger to organic practices. In fact, he sits on the uh, academic committee for the North Central SARE region. Uh, he's very active in, in a number of different pieces of work with that organization as well. So we do thank Darren. Uh, we're going to turn over to him. So with that, Darren, we'll just take over. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, as Mike said, I was uh, uh, the extension specialist primarily for vegetable crops, but I also worked with field crops as well. Um, for about 10, 12 years, and then I switched over to a research teaching position in about 2000, and uh, do most of my work uh, with uh, fungi, fungal pathogens of plants, and my focus is really in sort of finding alternative disease management practices by modifying environments and looking at effective uh, microbes in the environment on disease development and things like that. So I've had an interest in um, alternative agriculture or organic agriculture for a long time. And uh, so they uh, invited me to come and give this presentation to you today, and I was, I was happy to do that. When it comes to uh, disease management, um, whether it be in an organic system or in a conventional system, there's sort of some basics, some basic, we can divide the, the practices into um, different categories. What are cultural practices? And these are the ways in which we grow the crop um, to, uh, and so we can do things to minimize the chances of the d disease development. And cultural practices, when we're focusing on disease management, uh, break down into things like pathogen avoidance. This is doing things to try to make sure that the pathogen doesn't come into contact or has very minimal contact with the, the host plant. Um, sometimes we can't avoid that, and um, we just have to reduce the population of the pathogen. So we do things like crop rotation uh, to try to minimize the level of pathogen uh, that is present so that we can minimize the amount of disease that we see. Um, and then we can try to reduce the conditions that are favorable for disease to develop. Um, plant pathologists like to, to use something called the plant disease triangle to relate that how plant diseases develop and that a disease, disease is not the same thing as a pathogen. A disease is an interaction between a pathogen, a host, and the environment. So when we're trying to manage diseases, we can look at all three aspects of that plant disease triangle. Um, so with cultural practices, we're, we're trying to deal with reducing or minimizing the pathogen or changing the environment in some, such a way that disease doesn't develop as readily. The other aspect of that triangle is the host, and we can do things um, to d reduce disease by affecting the host. And so that uh, we usually think of as host resistance or uh, plant disease resistance. And so we can select varieties of the crop that are less likely to become diseased. Now, resistant doesn't necessarily mean immunity. In some cases, it does. We have things that are very highly resistant, and they don't get the disease at all. But in many cases, it's what we call partial resistance, where it just lowers the level of disease or lowers the severity of disease so that the impact of that disease is not as high. But the plant still shows some symptoms and signs uh, of the disease. And then um, we can look at uh, the possibility of pesticide applications. And um, we do this in both conventional and organic agricultural systems. Um, there are pesticides that are approved for use um, by the National Organic Program, um, and those have to fall under certain categories. Um, typically, they are what are called mineral-based uh, fungicides, for example, uh, things that are based on coppers or sulfurs rather than um, the organic-based, things that are carbon-based, which is and when I uh, talk to my students about this, they always seem to get confused, and I say, no, you cannot use uh, organic fungicides in organic agriculture um, because they are synthetic rather than um, being a natural. 
And we can also use biorational pesticides. Another name for that is biocontrol agents. So we use one organism to try to manage another organism. So we're going to go through some of these and uh, give you some specifics. But before we do that, um, one of the things that we think about or we should think about when we're trying to determine the, the types of uh, disease management practices that we want to use are the sources of disease. Where are pathogens likely to come from? Uh, some pathogens uh, overwinter in the field that we're going to be planting in. Um, some of them can be soil-borne, which means that the, typically a fungus or a nematode um, actually reside in the soil. And sometimes they can exist not as a pathogen, but as a, a saprophyte or a sapro uh, on other kinds of organic matter. And they become a pathogen when a plant is present. Other pathogens are residue borne, so they um, grow on a living plant during the growing season. And then when that plant residue is deposited on or in the soil, the pathogen is able to hold on to that piece of plant material and stay there for a while. And then the pathogens can become active in the spring when the, the host is present uh, and start the disease cycle over again. And some pathogens actually can uh, exist on their alternate, on alternate hosts uh, in the field and then move on to the host that we're interested in when, um, when the situation arises. All right, so um, the, other, the other way that pathogens can be introduced into a planting or into a field is on infested seed or infested planting stock. So in those cases, it's important to be aware of where we're getting our seed or planting stock. Um, there is, uh, in some cases, we can buy certified seed uh, that is certified as being disease free, or there are certain treatments that we can use to minimize the levels of pathogens that are present in or on our seed or planting stock. And then other pathogens have effective me mechanisms of long distance dispersal. So they can either be moved in the wind or they can be moved by insects. Um, and the, the reason this is important is that we have to manage these different kinds of pathogens differently. So uh, a pathogen that overwinters in the soil or on residue, we can do certain things like crop rotations um, to try to minimize the levels of those, whereas that really doesn't work for a pathogen that's able to travel for many miles in the wind. Crop rotation may not be effective for that kind of a disease. So we have to consider where the, the pathogen is likely to be coming from when we're looking at our disease management strategies. We also have to realize that for most diseases on most crops, um, we have to look at prevention rather than rescue. That means uh, we have to implement our management strategy at or before the time of planting, and that if the disease shows up during the cropping season, our possibilities for management are really limited, um, especially in organic systems. But even with conventional agriculture, it's best to prevent the disease rather than trying to um, deal with it once it arises during the growing season. So we have to, to plan ahead and think about you know, what kind of varieties we want to, to use and where we want to plant and that sort of thing. Because our options for treating diseases once they show up during the growing season uh, are really limited. But it still is important to scout for diseases during the growing season. even uh, so. In some cases, uh, there are things that we can do you know, to try to minimize them if they do start showing up. Um, but, but it's important to scout for a number of reasons. So number one, I have on there, why, why should we scout? If most of our practices are focused on things that we have to do at or before the time of planting. Um, and that's because many of those things rely on us knowing what kinds of diseases are present in the field. Uh, or what kind of diseases that we're seeing on a regular basis so that we can make appropriate decisions in the years to come. So if you know, you know that you're consistently having problems with uh, a certain kind of disease, then you can look for varieties that are resistant, or you can look at other kinds of cultural uh, management practices uh, that would help minimize that disease. If you're not really paying attention and you're not making records of 
the types of uh, diseases that show up and when they show up and where they show up, um, then it's hard to make adequate decisions you know, the following season when you're trying to, to plan ahead. Um, but the, again, there are, there are some diseases uh, where we do have some rescue treatments, and so in that case, you know, if we can pick them up early, um, we can implement those treatments and try to, to minimize their effect. When to scout, uh, it's important to have a good understanding of when uh, the various diseases are going to show up. So obviously, we have seedling diseases that are, are going to attack plants when they're fairly young. So you're going to want to scout uh, for seedling diseases uh, when the plants are in the seedling phase. And then we have other diseases, let's say powdery mildew on the cucurbit crops, cucumbers and pumpkins, or um, rust, common rust on sweet corn, they're going to show up later in the season. And so we don't really need to scout for them uh, at the beginning of the season, but we need to pay attention uh, to them, let's say, in the late July or early August. Uh, so it's important to understand what diseases are likely to occur in your area and when they are likely to occur so that you can go out and scout for them at the appropriate time. So what are some things that we can do uh, in terms of cultural practices uh, to minimize the level of disease that we see? Well, one is called avoidance, um, and that means avoiding or excluding the disease by making sure that the pathogen and the host don't come into contact. Um, and there's a number of ways to do this. One is that you uh, say go to where the pathogen isn't, and that means that you plant your your crop in an area where you know that the pathogen does not exist. Um, now we do this on a national scale. For example, we no longer grow pears commercially in Illinois to any great extent because of a disease called fire blight that came through and wiped out the pear industry um, back in the late 18, early 1900s. And so now we grow pears in other places in the country where the pathogen doesn't exist or where conditions aren't really favorable for the pathogen. But we can do the same thing in a field if we know that there's a particular pathogen or a particular disease that shows up in a certain area of the field. Well, you know, you don't plant a susceptible crop, a susceptible variety uh, in that location if you know that the pathogen is there. Similarly, we can grow our crop when the pathogen is not active. And so some pathogens are favored by, let's say, maybe cool, wet conditions early in the spring. So if we delay our planting till it warms up and maybe gets a little drier, the pathogen becomes inactive, uh, and then uh, we can plant our crop uh, and not experience a high level of disease. Other pathogens, they may be more prevalent later in the season, you know, maybe in a hot dry, or they don't show up in the, in the area until, let's say, end of July, beginning of August. And so maybe in those cases, we'll want to plant our crop a little bit earlier so that it uh, becomes established and starts to produce uh, whatever we're going to harvest off of it um, before the pathogen arrives, and then we can minimize our, uh, the impact of the disease that way. So knowing when the pathogen uh, is most active allows us to adjust when we grow uh, the crop to try to be there when the pathogen uh, isn't doing anything. We can also try to keep the pathogen out of, of our fields or of our plantings. Um, so if you, for example, if you are aware that there are certain diseases that can come in on seeds or come in on planting stock uh, and you want to make sure that those don't get established in your, in your field, then you, know, you might want to look into purchasing um, certified disease-free seed or certified disease-free planting stock. Uh, if you know that the pathogen may come in on infested soil, or let's say on equipment or tools, uh, then you might want to pay particular attention to cleaning off equipment if you know that you've been in an area where that pathogen exists and try to keep it from moving into a new field or a new location. So we can do things to minimize the movement of the pathogen. And sometimes that's done um, through legislation. There are plant quarantine acts, for example, that try to, to limit the spread of pathogens from one state to another or from one area to another. But we can still do that same kind of thing in our own plantings uh, or try to prevent 
a pathogen from coming into our fields uh, by being aware of the things that we're bringing in. We can also remove sources of inoculum. So as plants become diseased, in some cases it's feasible and effective to actually go and remove those. Or for something, uh, let's say, um, brown rot on stone fruits, uh, where the pathogen survives on um, dead fruit, uh, either on the tree or on the soil, we can go, act, go in uh, to an orchard and actually clean that out, take out that inoculum, uh, and then that will reduce the, the levels of disease that we're likely to see. So there's a number of things we can do to minimize the exposure of the host to the pathogen, and those generally fall under the category that we call avoidance. Another thing that we can do is select the sites where we're going to plant our crop uh, to make sure that uh, we find the most appropriate site uh, for whatever we're trying to grow. So we want to look at the cropping history. Um, pathogens tend to be somewhat host specific uh, and they tend to be more likely to infect things within the same plant family or the plant, same plant grouping. So for example, you know, tomatoes and eggplant and peppers all belong to the solanaceous family of plants. And so a pathogen that affects one of those may be able to infect uh, another one as well, whereas it's unlikely that it would you know, affect both a, a tomato and uh, a cucumber, for example. So if we, uh, be a, if we are aware of the cropping history, uh, we want to avoid things that are, avoid planting one plant after another if they're in closely related or in the same plant grouping uh, to minimize the chance that you know, have a pathogen that carries over from one season to the next. We also want to pay attention to the disease history. Um, so if we know, you know, for example, that we tend to see Rhizoctonia root rot show up in this particular location in the field uh, year after year, then we'll want to be aware of that and, and plant things in that area that are not particularly susceptible to that particular disease. And we want to be aware of the environmental conditions. So if we've had a very wet spring and we know that we have low areas of the field that are uh, have a very high moisture content, then we want to be aware that, you know, that we won't, don't want to plant things in that particular location that are susceptible to things like Phytophthora root rot or Pythium root rot. Um, so paying attention to environmental conditions, um, that sort of gets to the disease triangle part uh, where uh, we're looking at environment, the effective environment on disease development. So, Darren, since you're talking about environmental conditions, you do have a question that was asked about the effect of the cold winter weather on disease pathogens. Okay, yeah, the um, that's a good question because we know that there are some, for example, insects that don't survive well. Uh, I know most of the sweet corn uh, growers in the state are going to be happy because we're not likely to see uh, a lot of corn flea beetles surviving the winter. Um, but most diseases are not uh, significantly affected by winter temperatures. In fact, the way that I store fungi, I have a collection of uh, plant pathogenic fungi, um, and I keep those in their freezer. Uh, and uh, you know, that helps uh, maintain them in a, in a state that I want them in. So in most cases, uh, you know, cold winter temperatures are not going to have much of an effect on the types of disease that we see. Now, an exception to that are diseases that are insect vectored. So for example, uh, Stewart's wilt of sweet corn, the bacterium that causes that disease actually overwinters in the corn flea beetle. So these cold winter temperatures are really wiping out the flea beetle populations. So that means we're probably going to have very low levels of Stewart's wilt on corn um, this coming season just because the, the bacterium is not going to overwinter. Um, some of the other uh, diseases that are vectored um, by insects, they may not overwinter on them, but if they're moved from plant to plant by those insects and the insect populations are way down because of the winter conditions, then we could see reduced levels of those diseases as well. But I would say that in general, low winter temperatures doesn't really affect most plant pathogens. Um, the fungi uh, that are living, that are staying in the fields, um, they are perfectly capable of surviving winter temperatures, and then anything that's coming in on seed or being blown in on the wind, obviously that's not going to be affected by the winter temperatures either. But that's a, that's a really good question. 
So another thing that we can do uh, is to minimize the, the level of pathogens in the field uh, is to do crop rotation, um, realizing that many pathogens require a, a living host uh, for them to uh, reproduce and to, uh, to grow. And once that host is gone, then that pathogen can survive in that location for a, a minimum or a, a certain amount of time. And once its resources are exhausted, then its populations start to decline. Um, so some pathogens are susceptible to that and some aren't. So things that where the pathogen overwinters in the soil or overwinters on crop debris, um, pathogens that have low what we call saprophytic ability, meaning they don't have the ability to, to grow as a saprophyte in the soil. Um, they have to have a, a living plant in order to, to grow and reproduce. Um, those that have a very narrow host range and those that have a limited mechanism for long distance spread, those are the kind of diseases that are really effectively managed um, by crop rotation. And a lot of these are foliar diseases, uh, foliar uh, fungal leaf spots or bacterial infections where the pathogen, it may be able to survive from one season to the next on infested plant debris, but if you rotate at, away from a susceptible host for two or three years and that plant debris degrades, the pathogen doesn't have anywhere to live. It doesn't have a saprophytic ability, meaning it can't live on other kinds of organic matter. And if there aren't other hosts in the field that it can survive on, then its populations are going to decline and we're not going to see as much of an effect of that disease uh, in the future if we've rotated away from a susceptible host for two or three years. Now there are other pathogens, you know, that they don't fit these characteristics. You know, they, they are able to survive in the field without a susceptible crop or they have a very wide host range. Uh, so they can survive on weed species, or they have a, an effective mechanism of long distance spread. They can move in the wind or they can be uh, flown in on insects. And those types of diseases are not going to be able to be effectively managed by crop rotation. So some diseases are effectively managed by crop rotation, and here's some examples. Um, you see the carrot there that has uh, symptoms of root knot nematodes, and those nematodes are what we call an obligate parasite it means they have to they have to um, be on a living plant in order for them to reproduce and uh, to survive. And if you rotate away from a susceptible crop for uh, two or three years, the populations of those nematodes in the field are going to drop um, fairly significantly, and then you can come back in and, and plant a susceptible crop to a much lower level of the pathogen. Um, similar, same thing for um, black rot on crucifers. You have C1 there on cabbage. That's a disease caused by a bacterium. In general, bacteria do not survive in the field very well. Um, they don't have the, the structures that uh, many fungi do that allow them you know, to survive in the soil for extended periods of time. And so typically, you know, one year away from a, a susceptible host will take care of a lot of the foliar uh, bacterial pathogens that we commonly see. And then the picture on the bottom there is a, um, that's a toria leaf spot on uh, tomatoes. Um, and it again uh, is a, a pathogen that pretty much needs a host there. It's not an obligate parasite, but uh, it does need a, a susceptible host for it to, to grow and reproduce. Um, and if we rotate away from tomatoes for two or three years, then the population levels of that pathogen go way down. So these are examples of diseases that are effectively uh, controlled through crop rotation. And then we have some types of diseases that crop rotation really has no effect at all on. So for example, uh, powdery mildew on the um, cucurbits on um, pumpkins or squashes or cucumbers, uh, that pathogen does not overwinter uh, in this area. It does not overwinter in the Midwest. It actually survives on susceptible plants to our south. And then as the wind currents blow from south to north during the growing season, they bring the fungus uh, up with them. And it has a, a spore that's able to travel in the wind for many miles. Um, and so typically this is a disease that we don't see showing up in our plantings until, let's say, maybe the middle of July or, or even the beginning of August. 
um, because it's taken that long for the, the pathogen to make its way northward. And so rotating uh, an individual field to try to eliminate this pathogen, it, it doesn't really work because the pathogen isn't surviving there in the first place. Uh, the picture in the middle is a picture of Rhizoctonia root rot uh, on uh, beans. And this is a pathogen that is a very good uh, soil saprophyte. So this one does survive in the field. But the pathogen, this particular pathogen, is able to grow on other kinds of organic matter. It doesn't need a living host in the field in order to survive. And so rotating away from a susceptible host doesn't really affect the population of uh, Rhizoctonia in the soil very much. Um, and it, it has a very wide host range also, so it can go to other, other kinds of plants. The, picture on the far left there is a picture of a, a virus disease. And viruses do not overwinter in the field uh, on crop debris. Um, you know, once the, once the plant dies, the virus particles in the plant uh, die as well. So viruses have to come in typically either on insects. In many cases, aphids bring viruses in. Or in some cases, they come in on seed. Or there's some other ways, but they don't they don't overwinter in the field in the first place, so crop rotation is not going to be effective for virus types of diseases either. There are some diseases that are sort of in between; they're in the middle. Um, the picture on the left there is white rust. Uh, that's I think that's on mustards or collards or something like that. Um, that's caused by uh, a fungus or a fungal-like organism, actually. Um, that is able to survive in the soil for an extended period of time. So if you rotated you know, for one or two years, that wouldn't be enough for the, the pathogen populations to go down. But if you rotated for five or six or seven years, then the pathogen population would start to decline. Um, so with that one, um, it's able to, it has a, a, a resting structure that's able to survive for several years in the absence of the susceptible host. So long-term crop rotation would work, but a short-term crop rotation would not. Um, the pepper in the middle there is infected by um, bacterial spot. And in most cases, you know, crop rotation will take care of bacterial spot, but this is also a disease uh, it can survive for a very short period of time, maybe you know one winter season on infected crop debris, uh, but it wouldn't survive much more than that. But it can also come in on infected seed or on transplants. So while crop rotation will eliminate any inoculum that survives in the field, if we're not careful about the seed that we bring in or the transplants that we bring in, if those are infected with the pathogen, then we're going to bring the, the disease in the field as well. The picture on the right there, that's northern corn uh, leaf blight on uh, corn. And this pathogen uh, can survive for may maybe one or at maybe at most two seasons on corn debris. And so if we rotate away from, from corn, then that pathogen is going to die out. And so crop rotation is effective for that disease in some places. Unfortunately, it's not effective in the Midwest because we have just lots and lots of corn here. And so you may rotate away from sweet corn in your particular field, but you know, just you know, the next field over or a quarter mile away, you know, there's been corn growing in that field. And this fungus does produce spores that can blow in the wind for a certain distance. And so in the Midwest, we just have so much inoculum floating around for this particular pathogen that crop rotation is not effective here. It is effective in other parts of the country where they don't have the you know, massive acres of corn that we have. So in, for these ones, you know, crop rotation can be somewhat effective, but uh, it's not going to eliminate the problem completely. Sort of related to crop rotation, there's sort of another aspect of things that we can do to the, um, the planting or to the, the field, um, and that is uh, planting cover crops which in some way is kind of a, a crop rotation in that you're including another, another type of plant there. It's, um, but it, in terms of disease management, it, it's going to work a little bit differently uh, than you know, just waiting out the, the pathogen because you're not adding any more time from, crop, from susceptible crop to susceptible crop. You're just putting another plant in there. But there are still some possibilities for uh, lowering the amounts of disease that, that we see through the use of cover crops. 
one of the things that cover crops can do is to promote something that we call disease suppressiveness in the soil. And this is really a biological condition where we don't understand it very well, but um, if we add organic matter to a soil, if we add nutrients to a soil that stimulates the growth of bacteria and fungi in, the, in that soil, and that can do several things. One, it can um, be antagonistic towards the pathogens, I mean, the fungi and bacteria can actually attack um, the, the plant pathogens directly, or they can actually induce re disease resistance in the host. So we are aware that um, in some cases, uh, plants respond to non-pathogens and actually, you know, if a, a non-pathogen is present, it sort of, you know, uh, stimulates the plant to uh, start defending itself against potential pathogens and that actually makes it more resistant when pathogens are, do show up. Uh, so we can, it's what we call induced disease resistance or acquired systemic resistance uh, is another name for it. And we know that cover cropping can do that. Uh, by elevating the levels of non-pathogens in the soil. Some cover crops, uh, for example, some of the crucifers like broccoli and, and mustards, they contain uh, chemicals in the plant that actually act as a biofumigant. So once you till that crop into the soil, it releases those chemicals uh, called isothiocyanates um, for the crucifers, and that actually, those chemicals will actually uh, inhibit or in some cases kill out um, soil-borne pathogens. And uh, this is being looked at uh, pretty extensively in California in some cases uh, where they're trying to get rid of uh, pathogens that they can't get rid of any other way. The other thing that cover crops do uh, is they help improve the growing conditions for the plant, and because of that, in many cases, that will make the plant less susceptible to, uh, or at least um, if the disease does show up, it's not going to have as much impact. So if we improve the tilt of the soil, we improve the water holding capacity of the soil, the nutrient holding capacity of the soil, the plant is just healthier to start out with and it's better able to uh, fend off uh, any diseases that may develop. So cover cropping um, can, can help us in a number of ways. Now I have recently seen some uh, studies that saying that you know cover crops can actually lead to to more disease, and so we have to be careful with the the cover crops that we plant. We don't want to plant a grass in front of a corn crop, for example, because there may be some common pathogens or insects that uh, then lead from lead from the cover crop to the main crop, and so we have to be careful about that. I'm actually just finishing up a study um, funded by uh, the North Central SAIR program where we're looking at the effect of cover crops on soybean diseases, and I've looked at um, uh, four, different, four different cover crops and compared that to a fallow, looking at rye and rape and canola and mustard, and look, seeing if they have an effect on the following soybean crop that we plant. And so here, the, the first year of the study, we saw some pretty dramatic results. The, the picture on the left there is uh, the fallow, where we didn't put a cover crop in and then planted uh, soybeans into them. Uh, and then the one on the right is the same thing, except we actually inoculated it with the pathogen Rhizoctonia solani that causes Rhizoctonia root rot. And you can see that we had uh, a very high level of uh, seed mortality and very few plants actually came up where we put the pathogen into the soil. We did the same thing where we had a rye cover crop that we had incorporated into the soil about two weeks before planting. You can see some of the rye stubble uh, on the soil surface there. And there we couldn't really see much of a difference between where we added the pathogen and where we didn't. And, and it, was a, it was a dramatic, and we saw this you know, consistently throughout the, throughout the trial. So I was thinking, wow, this, this is really fantastic. Unfortunately, we didn't see the same level of disease in the following two years, so it wasn't quite as dramatic, although we did, we were able to document a significant reduction in the amount of Rhizoctonia in all three years, you know, where we put in the pathogen in the rye planting as compared to where we put the pathogen uh, in the fallow uh, areas. And so we have some good evidence that the, the addition of cover crops can reduce diseases uh, in certain situations, not all, but in certain situations. Here's another um, some other research that I uh, gathered looking at um, transitioning to organic agriculture, looking at different cropping systems and different organic amendments and what kind of effect that had on certain diseases. 
And in this case, we're looking at three different uh, additions, uh, adding animal manure um, that was not composted, adding a manure that was composted, and then not applying any additional organic matter. And you can see that, for, for example, with cucumber mosaic on tomatoes or anthracnose on tomatoes, that we saw much less disease uh, where we had the manure as compared to adding the composted manure or not adding anything at all. So the, the, the application of the fresh manure resulted in lower levels of disease in those cases. In other parts of that same study, we saw higher levels of disease uh, where we applied the manure. And in this case, uh, we're seeing uh, a higher level of common rust on corn uh, in plots where we had applied the manure. And we actually, we weren't surprised at this because it's been documented in other studies that if you increase the level of nitrogen, you actually increase the susceptibility of corn to this particular disease. And so that's what we think was going on here. So it's not, you know, it's not a one size fits all or, you know, it, you can always say that if you add organic matter, you're going to reduce disease. In some cases, you know, we're, in this case, we added a certain kind of organic matter and actually increased the disease. So uh, we have to be aware that it's going to be specific for each crop and each type of disease that we may be running into. There are things that we can do to modify the environment uh, to try to make it less uh, conducive for the development of the pathogen. So even if the pathogen is there and we have a susceptible host there, maybe we can do things uh, that make it less likely that that pathogen is going to be able to infect and cause a disease. One of the things that we need to pay attention to is the amount of water. Most diseases are very closely tied to uh, some aspect of moisture, whether it's uh, soil moisture or water on the, the foliage, on the leaves. And so if we manage our our water correctly, we can minimize the infection. Um, for example, when you, if you're going to apply water through sprinkler irrigation, uh, when you apply that irrigation is important in reducing disease levels. So if you apply a sprinkler irrigation early in the morning, and it, so you stop irrigating, let's say by 10 o'clock in the morning, then you have the rest of the afternoon uh, for those plants to dry off and the plants stay dry you know, throughout the, the rest of the evening. And so the, the plants are only wet for a, a very short period of time. If, on the other hand, if you're irrigating, sprinkler irrigating late in the day, um, then those plants are going to stay wet throughout the night and they're not going to dry out till the following morning. Many pathogens, fungi and bacteria included, they will respond to certain hours of, of leaf wetness. So you know, it may take six hours of leaf wetness for the fungal spores to germinate and infect. And so if you irrigate early, maybe you'll only have three hours of leaf wetness and then the, the spore won't germinate. But if you irrigate late in the day, then, it, then you're going to have you know, uh, 10 or 12 hours of leaf wetness and the, the pathogen does have a chance to infect. So uh, we can also uh, look at how frequently we apply water and how much water we apply at a given time, uh, all those things. Uh, can affect the levels of disease that develop, and we have to be aware of that. We can do, even do things like orienting the rows uh, of our plantings to promote air movement. So if we know that we typically have um, the, the prevailing winds in our area go from southwest to northeast, then we can orient the rows in that direction uh, and having the wind uh, blow through the rows as compared to uh, planting perpendicular to the prevailing winds, and that would really slow the movement of air uh, through the planting. The reason that's important is air movement will drop the leaf wetness uh, more rapidly, and again, the longer the leaves remain wet, the more likely that you're going to have infection uh, due to certain bacteria and fungal pathogens that require that. We can also use mulches to try to minimize the movement of pathogens from the soil up onto the plant. And these can either be uh, organic mulches um, or uh, you know, paper or plastic mulches. And the idea here is just to prevent, to present a physical barrier to uh, minimize the movement of fungal spores or bacterial cells that may be on either in the soil or on plant debris on the soil surface to prevent those from moving up to the plant. Um, and it's been shown that uh, the use of mulches is, can do that fairly effectively. And then for things like um, strawberries, where 
the fruit may be laying on the soil surface, if we can provide a barrier between that fruit and the soil, um, we can minimize the infection of that fruit from pathogens that may be living there. So another important, I think I mentioned this already, that uh, one way that the pathogens get into our field is by, is coming in on infected seed. Uh, so um, if that is a possibility, we, uh, you can look for disease-free seed. There are, in some cases, you can buy certified disease-free seed or planting stock potatoes, for example. You know, we don't plant seed, but we plant seed pieces, and you can buy certified disease-free uh, seed pieces of potatoes. The other, another thing we can do is hot water treat um, our seed or, or planting stock. The idea here is that pathogens are, uh, will become non-viable. They will die uh, when uh, the water, hot water is applied. The trick is to getting uh, an exposure that's hot enough and long enough to kill the pathogen, but not uh, hot and long enough to kill the, the plant or to kill the seed, because you wouldn't want to do that. And so it's important to sort of test it on small batches first to make sure that you're not uh, killing your seed. And there's actually um, timing tables that have been uh, developed for this. So here's an example where um, Brussels sprouts or eggplant seed, if you treat them for at um, 122 degrees for 25 minutes, you're going to get rid of uh, some of the important pathogens on there. You can see that different types of seeds can tolerate different durations and different temperatures, uh, and uh, so you need to pay attention to that. Disease resistance is important disease management strategy. Um, often this is the easiest way to, to manage diseases. If you plant something that's highly resistant, um, you know, then uh, you don't have to, to worry about some of the other things, although it's best to sort of uh, implement these in an integrated management uh, plan where you're uh, looking at other disease management strategies as well. But typically, disease resistance is very cost effective. Uh, it's usually fairly consistent. And it integrates well with other management options like crop rotation or uh, orientation of um, rows and things like that. Unfortunately, we don't have resistant varieties for all diseases of all crops. And so it may, it may be that you have to select and say, well, I can you know, get a tomato variety that's resistant to leaf spot, but it's susceptible to fusarium. And you have to decide which of those is more important. And again, um, finding certified seed that is also organic um, can be problematic. And uh, um, so disease resistant, if, you know, if it's a genetically modified trait, um, that's not allowed in organic agriculture. So um, we're somewhat limited. Um, to help you figure out you know, possibilities for disease resistance, there are some uh, resources for that. One that is, uh, I find particularly helpful is the Vegetable MD Online that comes out of Cornell. Um, if you do a Google search for that, uh, you can find it. And they have lists of um, different vegetables, for example, and you click on there. and, and uh, it will give you a table that looks something like this. So this is for tomato, tomatoes, uh, looking at different varieties, and it will tell you what particular diseases an individual variety is known to have resistance towards. Sometimes, as you can see, that uh, there are um, three different versions of fusarium wilt, and so you, have, you may have to know, you know, I have race one of fusarium wilt or race two of fusarium wilt, and if you don't plant the right variety, uh, even though it's resistant to fusarium wilt, you're still going to get the disease because it's not resistant to that particular race. But uh, those resources are helpful for you. So rescue strategies, that means being able to go and actually deal with the disease once it's shown up in the field. And those are really fairly limited, uh, especially in organic systems uh, where we don't have the availability of some of the um, synthetic fungicides that uh, conventional growers use. But there are other things that we can do. One is sanitation. Um, so if we see disease developing on certain plants, we can actually go out and remove that infected tissue to limit the spread of the pathogen from one plant to another. Uh, we can also rogue out infected plants. Um, this is particularly useful for some virus diseases where it takes them a while to spread from plant to plant. So if you go and actually remove those infected plants out of the field, that can be effective. And there are some chemical strategies um, that organic growers can use, um, both chemical and biological. 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of these. We'll, I'll show you some uh, comparisons uh, of these. Uh, some of them are effective and some of them are not. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about compost teas. So I have a couple of these uh, slides uh, looking at studies done uh, in various parts of the country. This is a trial that was done by Sally Miller at Ohio State looking at several different treatments uh, that are approved for organic agriculture on tomatoes um, and seeing how effective they were uh, for foliar diseases. And the, you can see at the top there is the the water control, they just sprayed with water to see how much disease they got and they got, you know, 66 percent of the foliage was infected by the disease. Uh, the one at the bottom there is Bordeaux mixture, that is a copper sulfate in lime that is allowed uh, under organic production. And you can see they, that uh, uh, allowed for very fairly good control uh, of the foliar diseases. And then some of the other things in here, uh, Storox, that's a um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, some of these things, uh, Serenade uh, is a uh, biological control agent, uh, the Timorex, that's a neem oil extract. So there's different kinds of things on here and you can see that a lot of these were not really that effective at, when you compare it to the control. So anything with a B after it is not significantly different than from the control on a statistical basis. Um, so just because something is registered or something is allowed in organic agriculture does not necessarily mean that it's going to be effective for managing that disease. But some things are. You know, the Champion and Bordeaux mixture, those are both uh, copper compounds and those were effective. Uh, here's a, another study um, that was done uh, just this past year uh, uh, looking at, again, foliar diseases on tomatoes. Um, the, the one on the bottom there, uh, the Cuvia, that is actually a synthetic fungicide, um, and you can see that it controlled the, the diseases fairly well, but that's not actually allowed to be used in organic agriculture, uh, where most of the other things on there, um, again, a mixture of biocontrol agents or plant extracts, those weren't really that effective. But in some cases, they are. Um, so here, um, you can see that uh, uh, Sonata, um, well actually no, and that one didn't, let me move on to the, the next one. Here's, here's one where some of these treatments uh, were effective at controlling uh, powdery mildew. I think this is on squash plants, um, including milk. Um, spraying whole milk onto the plants uh, was actually able to significantly reduce the amount of powdery mildew uh, that was seen. So in some cases, uh, these treatments do work. Uh, in some cases they don't. So it's good to uh, sort of not just trust um, the uh, gossip or uh, the literature that the company selling it is putting out, but actually to try to find some unbiased trial information so you can see whether things work. Um, here's another one uh, looking at gray mold on strawberries. And um, the bot protector, that, that's a biocontrol agent and the sil matrix uh, one that's actually a, um, a silica treatment. And some of these were effective uh, when compared to the control. Some uh, organic growers like the idea of making compost teas. This is where they take uh, you know, plant matter and mix it with water and allow it to, to ferment for a while and then spray that, you know, drain that off and spray it onto uh, their crop. In some cases, they may be adding sugars like molasses. Um, I really am leery about recommending this. Uh, and then in some cases, they're shown to be effective, and in some cases, they're not. I really worry about the fact that we don't really know what's growing in there. Uh, fungi and bacteria can make some really nasty things that are not good for us if we consume them. And so I would, you know, I would be... Uh, um, hesitant to, to recommend that. There's a possibility of actually growing human pathogens. And we've seen things in the news about you know, E. coli or listeria showing up uh, on spinach or on uh, cucurbits uh, because of contamination issues. And uh, you know, I'm just hesitant on compost teas. And in fact, the state of uh, Washington put out a warning you know, saying that con uh, compost teas can contain elevated levels of human pathogens and propose a food safety risk. So while the, actually the National Organic Program does have guidelines for using compost teas, and for example, you know, they say uh, don't add 
uh, additives, you know, like uh, molasses, because that can increase the levels of uh, human pathogens in them. Um, again, I would be concerned about putting, spraying that onto a tomato or something that I was going to eat within a few days. So I would recommend, you know, being cautious in terms of that. So the take home message uh, for management of diseases in organic systems is to pay attention to the disease history. That's important when you're going to be determining what varieties and locations and practices you're going to use in the following seasons. So it's important to scout regularly and know what diseases are showing up on what varieties and in what parts of the field and what time of year so that you can plan ahead properly. Um, as we saw, you know, some of the, the treatments that are uh, available to organic uh, growers are effective, but some of them are not. So be skeptical of things that are untested um, and rely on unbiased uh, research to, to help you choose things that are, that are known to be effective. And the bottom line is don't rely on one thing uh, to manage your diseases. Um, Implement an integrated pest management program where you're incorporating disease-resistant varieties with crop rotation schedules, with you know proper planting of time and uh, water management um, in an appropriate level, so that uh, you minimize the risk and you improve uh, the bottom line overall. There are a number of places where you can go to get information on disease management uh, in organic systems. Uh, Cornell University puts out a an organic insect and disease management guide. Uh, it's now in the second edition. But you can find that on the web. Uh, there's uh, the University of Florida has a two-part series uh, on organic management, organic management for vegetable crops. One for the soil-borne problems and one for foliar problems. And then the University of California has a nice um, manual on disease management in organic crops as well. And I think. That uh, is the last of my slides, and I would be happy to uh, to take any questions through the chat system if you've got them. There is some questions there, Darren. There is a question from Steve asking uh, for soil-borne pathogens while tilling the soil before planting help. Um, I would say mostly no. Um, it might it might uh, help if you're talking about um, burying inoculum or burying plant debris. So, for example, we see uh, much more foliar diseases in no-till corn where there was corn in the field last year and corn debris left on the surface. And then if you would plant corn back in there again, the pathogens on, on that debris can get up onto the, up onto the corn crop. Um, and in that case, if we go in and till and bury that inoculum, then that minimizes the, the infection somewhat. Um, so if we bury the debris, yes, uh, just the, the act of tillage itself um, would probably have a minimal effect for anything that's in affecting the root system. So if you're talking about something like Rhizoctonia or Phytophthora, where it's in the soil and infecting the root system of the plant, tillage probably isn't going to do a lot for controlling those kinds of diseases. Another question, Darren, on that slide you showed indicating that whole milk applied as a foliar application helped control powdery mildew and squash. The question was if they could use uh, powdered milk and have the same similar response. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't really know. Um, powdery mildew, the reason that that works is that the spores are very susceptible to being wet. Powdery mildew spores do not like to get wet. Um, so actually uh, spraying a little bit of soapy water on your rose plants, for example, helps minimize the amount of powdery mildew. Um, they like high humidity, but they don't actually like getting wet. And so I suspect what the whole milk is doing is that it's acting as a surfactant, a wetting agent, and actually allowing those spores to get wet. And whether the powdered milk has that same surfactant quality, I don't know. Probably it might be the fat levels in the whole milk that's able to do that, you know, sort of the, uh, the mixture of uh, fats in the, in the milk and the protein. Um, so I don't know if, for example, would non-fat milk give you the same result. I, 
I suspect not, but if you could get a, a low fat or a whole powdered milk, that, that might work. So, and then there's a worm castings instead of compost tea. Um, again, I probably wouldn't do that and spray it on something that I was going to eat directly. So if you're talking about spraying it on an apple that you're going to pick and eat or spraying it on a, a tomato that you're going to pick and eat, the, you, know, the, you don't know what bacteria and fungi are in those worm castings. Um, if, you're, if you're treating root systems or treating foliage before you know, the, the fruit comes out, that might be a possibility. But again, if I don't know what's in it and I don't know what kind of bacterial or fungal products are coming out of something that's un not regulated very well, I would be concerned. I have a question about solarization on a small scale. Um, so if you're not familiar with the, the concept of solarization, that's actually where you uh, cover a, a soil. Uh, it's actually most effective if you cover it with clear plastic. What that does is it lets the sunlight through and heats the soil. And has been shown to uh, either kill or inhibit uh, soil-borne pathogens. And that does work on a small scale. Um, you're going to have to be cautious about, you know, tilling, for example. You don't want to bring soil from a non-solarized area of the, of the planting into the solarized area, or it's going to minimize the effectiveness. But um, when I've actually done experiments with solarization on fairly small scale plots, you know, like 20 by 20, and it does work, at least for uh, a short time. What's my opinion of row covers to control airborne disease? Um, so most fungal spores, you know, are fairly small, and depending on what kind of row cover you're using, it may or may not keep them out. Um, definitely will help keep out diseases that are transmitted by insect vectors. Um, so if they're aphid-borne or um, we have uh, some bacterial diseases of the cucurbits, for example, that uh, cause bacterial wilt that are vectored by um, beetles. It will definitely keep, help keep those out. I really haven't seen any data on whether like the spun row covers lower levels of foliar diseases. In some cases, they actually may increase the level of disease because it raises the level of humidity uh, in the canopy. And again, if the, if the uh, inoculum is coming from the soil and it's coming up, uh, then a row cover you know, may not uh, be effective for those and actually, again, you know, may promote more disease because um, you have a higher level of uh, humidity and leaf wetness. All right, Daryl, thank you for your presentation. We certainly appreciate it. All right. Thank you for the invitation. It was a lot of fun.